we witness the shocking courtroom outburst of Jason Howard as he reacts to his sentencing. Charged with the heinous crimes of killing his ex-girlfriend and her three children, Howard's explosive anger disrupts the calm and order of the courtroom. What makes this incident even more astonishing is the fact that Howard was punched repeatedly while standing handcuffed. As the courtroom proceedings were underway, the atmosphere seemed ordinary and calm. Jason Howard, a man suspected with the brutal killings of his ex-girlfriend and her three children, stood in handcuffs, awaiting his sentencing. Little did anyone expect the shocking turn of events that was about to unfold. In a sudden and unexpected outburst, Howard's anger erupted, shattering the tranquility of the courtroom. The video footage captures the moment when chaos ensues as Howard unleashes his fury on those around him. The tension in the room becomes palpable as Howard's emotions escalate to a boiling point. Amidst the commotion, one man seizes the opportunity to strike Howard. Reaching over the banister that separates the attorneys from the public, he lands a series of punches on the defendant. The force of the blows catches Howard off guard, and he attempts to dodge the relentless assault. But the violence doesn't stop there. Another man, fueled by anger or a desire for revenge, jumps over the banister, joining in the attack on Howard. The courtroom officers, taken aback by the sudden turn of events, scramble to intervene and protect the defendant. The delay in the officer's response only adds to the intensity of the scene. It takes approximately 10 seconds for the first officer to react and jump the bench, attempting to restrain the assailants and bring order back to the courtroom. The struggle to regain control is evident as the chaos continues to unfold. Throughout the ordeal, Howard sits speechless, overwhelmed by the sudden onslaught. The video captures his stunned expression, a mix of shock, fear, and disbelief. Despite the brutal attack, Howard manages to escape physical harm, thanks to the intervention of the officers. Following the incident, Howard is promptly examined by a jail doctor to ensure his well-being. Fortunately, he sustains no injuries from the assault. The Trumbull County Sheriff's Major Robert Davis confirms that Howard emerged physically unscathed from the ordeal. The attackers, identified as Louis West and Sultan Hanzu, both residents of Warren, are swiftly apprehended by authorities within the Trumbull County Courthouse. They are charged with assault, their actions caught on tape for the world to witness. To truly understand the gravity of the courtroom outburst and the shocking attack on Jason Howard, it is crucial to delve into the background of this troubled individual and the heinous crimes he is accused of committing. Jason Howard, a 24-year-old man, finds himself at the center of a horrifying series of events that have left a community in shock. Prior to the courtroom outburst, Howard was already facing charges for a separate violent incident that took place in Warren, Ohio. In that incident, Howard stands accused of killing a man and shooting two others. The details surrounding this crime are chilling. It occurred just days before the bodies of his ex-girlfriend, Jamila West, and her three children were discovered in Columbus, Ohio, approximately 140 miles southwest. Jamila West, a 27-year-old woman, was brutally slain alongside her 10-year-old daughter and two sons, age 3 and 5. The shocking nature of these murders sent shockwaves through the community, leaving friends, family, and neighbors devastated. The connection between the two incidents is undeniable, as Howard is the father of the youngest child who tragically lost their life. The loss of innocent lives and the brutality of the crimes have left a lasting impact on the community, forever altering the lives of those involved. As the trial for the murders of Jamila West and her children unfolds, the courtroom becomes a stage for the pursuit of justice. The charges against Howard are grave, and the evidence against him is compelling. The prosecution presents a strong case, meticulously piecing together the events leading up to the tragic deaths. Throughout the trial, Howard maintains his innocence, vehemently denying any involvement in the murders. He proclaims his innocence to the court, insisting that he did not kill Jamila West and her children. However, the weight of the evidence against him is substantial, leaving many questioning his claims. The courtroom outburst and the subsequent attack on Jason Howard have left an indelible mark on the victim's families. The emotional aftermath of this shocking incident is immeasurable as the family grapples with the trauma and the loss they have endured. Jamila West's mother, Victoria, who witnessed the entire ordeal unfold, has been deeply affected by the events that transpired in the courtroom. In an interview with the Vindicator of Youngstown, she recounts the harrowing moments that led to the outburst. Victoria explains that the melee began after she gave Howard a seemingly innocuous pat on the back of his head. In response, a deputy he grabbed her and forcefully put her on the floor, escalating the chaos. For Victoria, the courtroom outburst serves as a painful reminder of the tragedy that befell her daughter and grandchildren. It reopens the wounds of their loss, amplifying the grief that she carries in her heart. The emotional toll of witnessing the attack on Howard, the man accused of taking her loved ones away, is immeasurable. After all was said and done, Jason Howard was sentenced to life imprisonment. However, he still stands that he didn't kill Jamila and her kids. 
First, we have a story that will leave you speechless. It's the story of Tatiana Fusari, a woman whose life took a dark turn when she received a life sentence. Child Protective Services had been involved with Tatiana Fusari and her husband since 2014 after THC was found in the system of their eldest newborn child. This prior involvement raises questions about the couple's ability to provide a safe and nurturing environment for their children. Tragically, their 10-month-old daughter, Mary Welch, weighed only 8 pounds at the time of her death. Despite being aware of her underweight condition, Tatiana and her husband refused to seek medical assistance for Mary. They cited religious reasons and a lack of trust in the medical system as their justification. Shockingly, two of their three children had never been taken to a licensed doctor. The neglect and denial of medical care for their daughter are deeply disturbing. It raises concerns about the couple's priorities and their ability to prioritize the well-being of their children. The involvement of Child Protective Services and the reasons given by Tatiana Fusari and her husband paint a troubling picture of a family in crisis. During the investigation into the tragic death of 10-month-old Mary Welch, the conditions found in the family home were nothing short of horrifying. The county sheriff testified that the home was unhygienic, with evidence of vermin, insects, and mold. These conditions were far from suitable for raising children and raised serious concerns about the couple's ability to provide a safe and healthy environment. The doctor who performed the autopsy on Mary revealed disturbing findings. The infant was suffering from chronic malnutrition, which he believed was a result of the deliberate withholding of food and water. This revelation was a heartbreaking testament to the neglect and abuse that Mary endured in her short life. The combination of the unhygienic living conditions and the doctor's findings painted a grim picture of the environment in which Mary lived. Tatiana Fusari and her husband faced serious charges in the aftermath of their daughter's tragic death. In August 2018, they were initially charged with homicide felony murder. The severity of the charges reflected the gravity of the crime and the need for justice to be served. The the video capturing Tatiana and her husband's reaction to the charges went viral, sending shockwaves across the nation. Their expressions of disbelief and shock were captured for the world to see. The video served as a haunting reminder of the devastating consequences of their actions and the impact it had on those around them. That is a charge called homicide felony murder. It is light without parole. It requires a DNA sample to be taken upon arrest. The viral nature of the video brought widespread attention to the case, sparking a national conversation about child neglect and the importance of seeking medical assistance for children in need. It was a moment that left viewers speechless and further highlighted the urgency of holding Tatiana and her husband accountable for their actions. In June 2020, Tatiana Fusari's husband, Seth Welch, faced the consequences of his actions. He was convicted of first-degree murder in the death of their daughter, Mary Welch. The court deemed his actions to be premeditated and carried out with malice, leading to the harshest possible conviction. The judge sentenced Seth Welch to life in prison without the possibility of parole. This sentence reflected the severity of his crime and ensured that he would never be able to walk free again. It was a moment of justice for Mary and a step towards holding those responsible accountable for their actions. During her trial, Tatiana Fusari took the stand and shared her side of the story. She testified about the abuse she endured at the hands of her husband, Seth Welch. Tatiana claimed that he would rape and beat her, leaving her in a constant state of fear and submission. These revelations shed light on the dynamics of their relationship and the power dynamics that played a role in the tragic events that unfolded. Tatiana also stated that she was not permitted to take her daughter Mary to a doctor. She argued that the abuse she suffered prevented her from providing proper care for her child. While she acknowledged her daughter's deteriorating health, she claimed that she did not notice the severity of the situation and was unaware of the exact cause of Mary's death. Tatiana's testimony presented a complex narrative, intertwining her experiences of abuse with her defense regarding her inability to provide adequate care for Mary. It added another layer of complexity to the case and raised questions about the extent of her culpability in the tragedy. In November 2021, the time came for Tatiana Fusari to face her own sentencing. The court handed down a life sentence without the possibility of parole for first-degree murder. This meant that Tatiana would spend the rest of her life behind bars with no chance of ever being released. It was a sentence that reflected the severe severity of her crime and the irreversible loss of her daughter's life. In addition to the life sentence for murder, Tatiana was also sentenced to 15 to 30 years on the charge of first-degree child abuse. This additional sentence highlighted the court's recognition of the harm inflicted upon Mary and the need to hold Tatiana accountable for her actions. The other thing that this case I think really drives home is that there is insufficient consideration given the people that work in the criminal justice system. And I look at these photographs, 
and it's very hard. And I think you should be recognized more for the difficulty of what you do, and the same to the state. Christopher Rodriguez. Next, join us as we explore the events leading up to the sentencing, the heart-wrenching details of the crime committed by Christopher Rodriguez, and his emotional reaction to the verdict. This is a story that will make you question the depths of human depravity and the consequences that follow. As we begin our journey into the shocking case of Christopher Rodriguez, let's first explore the events that unfolded leading up to this momentous day. It all started in September 2017, when Larissa Rodriguez, the mother of five-year-old Jordan Rodriguez, found herself in a horrifying situation. Christopher, Larissa's boyfriend at the time, brought the young boy into her bedroom in a semi-conscious state. Instead of seeking immediate help or contacting authorities, Larissa and Christopher made a series of chilling decisions. They decided to give the boy a cold shower and then placed him in Larissa's bed, where he remained for a staggering 24 hours. Tragically, Jordan's condition worsened and he ultimately lost his life. Rather than facing the unimaginable reality of their actions, Larissa and Christopher made a shocking choice. They decided to bury Jordan's lifeless body in their own backyard, wrapping him in bags filled with mothballs to deter animals from disturbing the grave. For two months, the truth remained hidden until a tip from Pakistan, provided by Christopher's own brother, Scott Rodriguez, led authorities to the horrifying discovery. Scott, a member of the military serving overseas, received a call from Christopher confessing to the burial of Jordan's body. In a desperate plea for justice, Scott urged his brother to turn himself into the police. When Christopher failed to do so, Scott took it upon Upon himself to contact the authorities, ensuring that the truth would be revealed. The investigation led the authorities to Larissa Rodriguez's apartment, where after two days of painstaking digging, they uncovered the lifeless body of young Jordan on December 19th. The Cuyahoga County Medical Examiner's Office later confirmed that Jordan's death was a result of homicide, although the exact cause could not be determined. Additionally, it was discovered that Jordan had suffered previous injuries, including a fractured wrist and several broken ribs, indicating a history of child abuse. These Shocking events set the stage for the trial and subsequent sentencing of Christopher Rodriguez. Following their arrest, both Christopher and Larissa pleaded guilty to a range of serious charges related to the death of five-year-old Jordan Rodriguez. The plea deal reached in June of the previous year allowed the couple to avoid a trial for murder, which carries a potential life sentence. Instead, they pleaded guilty to charges of involuntary manslaughter, felonious assault, child endangering, and gross abuse of a corpse. This agreement was made in collaboration with the process prosecutors, and it set the stage for the subsequent sentencing hearings. Prosecutors and defense lawyers for the couple agreed to a recommended sentence of between 20 and 25 years for both defendants. However, during the sentencing hearing, Judge Nancy Margaret Russo made a shocking decision. While Larissa Rodriguez received a 25-year prison sentence, Judge Russo rejected the recommended sentence for Christopher Rodriguez. The emotional impact of the case was evident during the sentencing hearing, as prosecutors presented photographs of Jordan's life body, Judge Russo broke down in tears, expressing her disbelief and uttering the words, I don't know how you live with yourself, directly to Christopher Rodriguez. In the aftermath of the plea deal and the emotional sentencing hearing, Larissa Rodriguez, the mother of five-year-old Jordan Rodriguez, faced the consequences of her actions. Judge Nancy Margaret Russo, presiding over the case, handed down a 25-year prison sentence for Larissa. The sentencing of Larissa Rodriguez was a pivotal moment in the courtroom. As the judge pronounced the sentence, the weight of the crime and its impact on the young victim and the community became apparent. Larissa, who had pleaded guilty to charges of involuntary manslaughter, felonious assault, child endangering, and gross abuse of a corpse, now faced a lengthy period of incarceration. The 25-year sentence reflects the severity of Larissa's involvement in the tragic events that led to Jordan's death. It serves as a reminder that the justice system will not tolerate such acts of neglect and abuse, especially when they result in the loss of an innocent life. The emotional toll of the sentence was palpable. Larissa Rodriguez, who had been present throughout the trial and the subsequent hearings, now had to confront the consequences of her actions. The impact of the crime on the judge, the prosecution, and the community at large was evident as they sought to ensure that justice was served. With the sentencing of Larissa Rodriguez behind us, the focus now shifts to Christopher Rodriguez, the co-defendant in this harrowing case. Christopher, who pleaded guilty to charges of involuntary manslaughter, felonious assault, child endangering, and gross abuse 
abuse of a corpse awaited his fate as the courtroom braced for the sentencing. Judge Nancy Margaret Russo, known for her unwavering commitment to justice, faced the difficult task of determining the appropriate punishment for Christopher Rodriguez. Rejecting the recommended sentence of 20 to 25 years, she made a bold decision. Christopher was sentenced to the maximum term of 28 years in prison. The gravity of the crime and its impact on the community weighed heavily on Judge Russo's mind as she delivered the sentence. The courtroom was filled with a mix of emotions, ranging from shock to relief, as the realization set in that Christopher would spend nearly three decades behind bars for his role in the death of five-year-old Jordan Rodriguez. To the defense, this is equally difficult for you. I know as a judge I'm not supposed to show emotion. And in 22 years, I never have. This is one of the worst things I've ever seen in my life. Whatever this child's life was supposed to be, you made sure it didn't happen. Christopher's reaction to the sentencing was a moment of intense emotion. As the judge's words echoed through the courtroom, Christopher's face displayed a range of emotions, from disbelief to remorse. The weight of his actions and the consequences he now faced were palpable, leaving those in attendance with a sense of the profound impact of this tragic case. The 28-year sentence serves as a stark reminder that the justice system will not tolerate such heinous acts. It stands as a testament to the commitment of the court to hold individuals accountable for their actions, particularly particularly when they involve the loss of an innocent life. Jasmine Gordon. Next, we delve into the heart-wrenching case of Jasmine Gordon and her reaction to the sentencing for her involvement in the tragic death of her three-year-old daughter, Jamila Smith. In the quiet suburban neighborhood of Detroit, a horrifying crime unfolded, shattering the lives of those involved. Jasmine Gordon, a 24-year-old mother, and her boyfriend, Clifford Thomas, 33, found themselves at the center of a tragedy that would leave the community in shock. It was a September day when tragedy struck. Witnesses would later testify that Gordon's three-year-old daughter, Jamila Smith was not breathing when her mother rushed her to the hospital. Panic filled the air as Gordon pleaded for help, her desperation evident to those around her. Emergency medical technician Lakeisha Thaxton vividly recalled the distressing scene. She described how Gordon's voice trembled with fear as she frantically sought assistance for her lifeless child. Thaxton repeatedly asked Gordon what had happened, but the young mother remained silent, refusing to provide any answers. As medical professionals examined Jamila's lifeless body, they discovered a series of of disturbing injuries. Dr. Kilak Kesha, a forensic pathologist with the Wayne County Medical Examiner's Office, detailed the extent of the trauma inflicted upon the young girl. Abrasions were found on her right arm, along with healing abrasions on her forehead, right temple region, chest, upper back, and lower back. The sheer number and severity of the injuries left the medical team stunned. Prosecutors would later present evidence suggesting that Gordon and Thomas were responsible for the 50 injuries found on Jamila's body. The shocking revelation sent shockwaves through the courtroom as the full extent of the abuse became apparent. The injuries were not limited to the external surface. Internal bleeding was discovered in Jamila's head, stomach, and even her torn pancreas. During the trial, defense attorney Steve Bullock attempted to raise doubts about the cause of Jamila's injuries. He suggested that the young girl could have harmed herself by running into objects. However, Dr. Keisha swiftly dismissed this possibility, emphasizing that the injuries would require multiple impacts from multiple objects. The prosecution argued that Gordon did nothing to save Jamila, despite the child potentially showing symptoms of sepsis, which ultimately led to her untimely death. The medical examiner testified that the injury to the child's pancreas occurred approximately seven days prior to her death. He indicated that the injuries that this child has sustained, she would have been in a lot of pain and that her health and her ability to move around would have deteriorated greatly prior to her death. The courtroom was filled with a mix of emotions as the details of the crime were laid bare. Gordon, overwhelmed by the weight of the accusations against her, broke down in tears. Prosecutors claimed that her tears were not those of remorse, but rather a futile attempt to elicit sympathy. They argued that Gordon's inaction and failure to seek help for her daughter demonstrated a callous disregard for Jamila's life. Dwayne Smith, Jamila's father, also took the stand during the trial. He recounted a troubling incident that occurred a few weeks before his daughter's 
death. When Gordon dropped off Jamila, Smith noticed that the young girl was limping and had bruising on her leg. Concerned for his daughter's well-being, he questioned Gordon about the injuries. However, she dismissed them as a mere rash, leaving Smith deeply unsettled. Frustrated by the lack of action from Gordon, Smith reached out to Child Protective Services, CPS, to express his concerns. Sadly, his efforts went unanswered, and the tragic consequences of this failure would soon become apparent. It was later revealed that CPS had visited the house just weeks prior to the incident and found no cause for concern. The system's failure to protect Jamila would haunt those involved in the case. After all was said and done, Clifford Thomas and Jasmine Gordon were charged with involuntary manslaughter, felony murder, second-degree murder, and second-degree child abuse. As the trial unfolded, the courtroom became a battleground of conflicting narratives and legal arguments. John McWilliams, one of Gordon's defense attorneys, argued that there were serious questions regarding Jamila's injuries and whether they were a result of abuse. He suggested that the young girl may have had pre-existing medical conditions that led to a misdiagnosis and misunderstanding of the situation as child abuse. McWilliams painted a picture of a desperate mother who was wrongly accused, caught in a web of tragic circumstances. Despite the mounting evidence against them, the defense team continued to argue for their client's innocence. They questioned the credibility of the witnesses and attempted to cast doubt on the prosecution's case. The courtroom became a battleground of legal arguments, with each side fiercely advocating for their position. As the trial neared its conclusion, the tension in the courtroom reached its peak. The shocking outburst during the sentencing, where Dwayne Smith, overcome with emotions, lashed out at Clifford Thomas, added another layer of drama to an already intense trial. The chaos that ensued momentarily disrupted the proceedings, leaving everyone in the courtroom in shock. The sentencing would be a pivotal moment, determining the fate of Jasmine Gordon and Clifford Thomas. The courtroom held its breath as the judge prepared to deliver her verdict. After the chaos subsided, the judge continued with the sentencing. The courtroom held its breath as the sentences were announced, hoping for justice to be served. Jasmine Gordon was sentenced to 7, 15 years for involuntary manslaughter and 14, 25 years for first-degree child abuse as an aider and a better. These sentences would be served concurrently, ensuring that she would face the consequences of her actions. Clifford Thomas, on the other hand, received a sentence of about 6 years to 15 years for involuntary manslaughter and 1, 2 years for resisting and obstructing a police officer. The courtroom was filled with mixed emotions as the sentences were handed down. Some felt that the punishment was not enough for the heinous crimes committed, while others believed that justice had been served. Jasmine Gordon broke down in tears as the weight of her actions and the consequences of her choices finally sank in. The courtroom witnessed the raw emotions of a mother who had lost her child and now faced the reality of her role in the tragedy. The prosecution claimed that her tears were not those of remorse, but rather a desperate attempt to elicit sympathy. The sentencing marked the end of a long and painful chapter in the lives of those involved. The courtroom was left grappling with the devastating loss of a young life and the consequences that followed. The judge's decision aimed to bring a sense of closure and justice to the case, but the scars left behind would forever remain. Thanks for watching. Click on the videos on your screen for similar content.